Thank you very much everyone for joining us this afternoon and it's a very nearly Christmas so I do appreciate your time and attention and um, we're pleased to welcome you to our December hangout and I must admit I'm not very sure where this year's sort of gone and how we're already good way through through December and this is actually our last hangout for the year um, but I'm really looking forward to um, sharing this month's uh, topic with you so thank you for coming. And for those of you who have not been at a, a talk I've given before, uh, my name is Vicky Anderson. Um, I'm a senior systems engineer uh, working on the open source uh, satellite program. And uh, my contact details are here um, and you're welcome to drop me a line um, and also, you know, type me down on, on LinkedIn or whatever. And there will be some contact details at the end as well for the project generally. So do feel free to contact one of us if you've got any questions or any, any particular topics of interest. So what is it that we're going to cover today? So I'm I'm really excited about today's talk because it's a, a topic that really is um, quite close to, to my heart. And we're going to talk about how we architect a satellite. So we're going to go through what it is you need to think about before you even pick up a pen and what the architect architecture you know what an architecture actually is um, along with sort of the different types of architecture that you can you can see and and what it is we actually need to think about and, and why you know we do we need to consider these things when constructing a, a satellite and what I'm going to do as I go through this presentation is use some examples from the open source satellite program to kind of illustrate some of these points so let's say you know you know you want to build a satellite right but you know what do you what do you actually do do next how do you get from that initial idea through to something that you can actually physically realize something you can go down and and touch you know where do you start and um, I am as guilty as, um, of this as the, as the next person but um, engineers we have a, a tendency to uh, perhaps dive off in in the deep end and get stuck into all the nitty-gritty of the widgets the designs and the developments and uh, you know we sort of sometimes forget to sort of before we pick up that pencil and disappear down that rabbit hole to sort of close off some in, you know important topics important topics first so we're going to look at you know where is it that we actually need to start now the first and i think one of, well i'm going to say this probably a few times and i'm going to keep saying this is a really important point but this really is one of the important points of the of the presentation and one of the probably most important i make in the presentation is you need to make sure that you understand everything and okay you're not going to understand everything everything um but you need to be pretty certain around some key points um before you go any further you know before you pick up that pencil and start designing some of the bits that you want to go inside your satellite so we start with the who's so who is your customer and it should be noted that your customer may not actually be the end user. Um, you know, your customer might be the person fronting the money for the system, but they might actually never interact with it. You know, um, there's probably likely to be other stakeholders in the loop. So maybe like operators, so they're the people who um, interact with the satellite on a day to day basis, sending commands to it, getting data down from it. Um, you may also have end users. So these are people who actually, you know, take the information that the satellite is providing and use it to satisfy some kind of application. And so what I find useful is to perhaps think about roles when it comes to stakeholders, rather than getting stuck on kind of people or, or names, because it could be also that one stakeholder actually holds many roles. So in some cases, your customer, um, the person fronting the money, may actually also be, be the end user too. So they actually wear two, two hats, which sometimes actually might be conflicting hats. Um, so understanding kind of who, what the different roles are also helps you make sure that you don't don't miss anything. You don't miss anything that these people want or are interested in from the system you're trying to create. Um, and as engineers, as part of the engineering program, you know, we're responsible for building the system right, but also building the right system. And I appreciate those two things sound very similar, but they're actually subtly and importantly different things. So building the system right relates to building something that meets the requirements that have been set whereas building the right system is all about whether you've actually built the thing that satisfies the need you know is actually what someone wanted so you you can actually end up in a scenario where you build the system right but not actually build the right thing if you don't get kind of what you what you're trying to build right at up front so it's quite an important thing to to to, to have a con you know understanding and handle on and what other stakeholders are there? So 
there's I mean I've thrown a few up on the on the screen here you know you've got you've got some obvious stakeholders like your customer and your end users but there are actually a lot of other stakeholders that you need to consider too and um, you know we've got regulatory bodies and this is a particular particularly important area for space without the appropriate approvals and licensing your satellite wouldn't actually better be launched or be used which you know if you put all that effort in would be a really unfortunate place to to be um, you know there's a potential for for many different types of stakeholders and um, what I've got here now is uh, a figure on the screen which is actually showing an example which some of you may have seen in previous oversaw satellite talks and this is a snapshot of something that we call a pig in the middle diagram and um, what we've used this for is to help us collate um, our various stakeholders that have an interest in the system in our open source satellite program, which you can see at the bottom of the of the screen in, in the square. And not only do you collate who your stakeholders are, but also what their interest in the system is. And um, what I think is interesting, um, well, yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting. Maybe someone else might think it's interesting too. But, you know, you've actually, if you look at that, there's actually stakeholders on there that you really don't want. But unfortunately, you do have to consider. So right at the top at 12 o'clock um, on that figure, we've got malicious third parties. So these are, you know, if we think about this connected digital age, right, there are parties out there who want to get hold of our data, want to do things with it that we don't necessarily want them to do. And they would like to, you know, take great pleasure in disrupting or destroying things that we create. So we also need to think about some of the things and steps that we need to take to prevent some of these interests, things that we actually don't, you know, people we don't want to be interested, but we have to consider whilst we're going through the design phase so we can take some of the appropriate steps to mitigate their effect or their impact. So if I continue along this theme of understanding, it's also really important to consider, you know, what is the problem that the customer is actually trying to solve? You know, what is it they're trying to do? Do they understand the problem? Do you understand the problem? You know, remember, we, we need to engineer something that, you know, fulfills the customer's need, you know, otherwise it's going to be wasted effort and you're going to have an unhappy customer at the end. And something else to think about is, you know, so for example, is a satellite a good fit for this job or is there an alternative? And um, I'm not suggesting that you, you, know, you do yourself out of a job, but, you know, it's, it's really worth considering, you know, is a satellite the sole or only system required to actually solve a problem? Or would actually a hybrid system be of benefit or maybe a constellation of satellites? So there's lots of factors to, to consider. And so we've talked about the people and we've talked about the, 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 so we talked about the stakeholders and we talked about kind of what it is the problem is that needs to be solved. What you've also got to think about is what the other systems are that are involved that also need to be considered. So a satellite doesn't operate in isolation. You normally have to interact with other systems such as a ground station, you know, to be able to get your information down to the ground. And so you need to think about, you know, what are these other systems? How much influence or control will you have? In some cases, you'll have a lot of control over that ecosystem. You know, it might be you own a lot of that ecosystem, so you can pick from your own and, 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 and cause, you know, changes. So you might be that, you know, you, you get to work with the ground station provider and have some um, sort of control over the interfaces and protocols that are used but other times it might be there's some kind of service level contract in place and you have to go with a particular provider and you have to fit in with whatever has already been specified so you know so there's the different systems but also the different degree of influence and control that you have as well so these are all really important things to kind of get your head around before you even start your design now looking at kind of how we use space and things was a massive part of of the exploration um, for the open source satellite because there's many 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 different possible applications of space and um, you'll know if you've heard us talk about the open source satellite before what we're really looking to do is generate a platform so satellite platform that can be used as the basis for many different applications as possible without having to do lots of rework every time. So you take the, the, the platform and you can put different payloads on it. So you can take pictures of the earth, you can um, use it for communications, you know, and there's minimal changes between. And this is why we, you know, we're looking at doing this to help bring down the price point and the entry into the space market. So if we take this example, we don't just have one customer that we're trying to satisfy then with the open source satellite or just one supplementary system. 
you know, we're trying to service a whole range of different customers and um, systems, some of which don't maybe even exist yet. And so I think when we went through, we ended up over like 300 odd different applications and combinations of, you know, different bits and pieces. And this is, I must admit, it's way more than I can consider, consider at any one, any one time. And I've just, um, this is just, again, just a snapshot of, of some of the different kind of ways we started thinking about the information and some of the different um, things that we put together to give us a different combinations. And I admit, I have not considered all 300 applications, but if you kind of look at it, and I th we've talked about this sort of previously in some of our other presentations, there are some natural groupings, and this kind of formed the basis of the assessment that we, we performed um, whilst looking at what it is that the open source satellite needs to do. If you kind of look at a satellite and, and satellite platforms at a at a high level, they they generally have very similar needs regardless of the applications. And so this really gave us a good sort of starting point to do some of our assessment our assessment on. OK, so you've heard me use the word needs a lot. And what does it I actually mean by needs and how do you get from a need to something you can actually build, right? So I like to think of a need as something that you're trying to achieve in order to solve a problem. Um, it doesn't tell you what to do or how to do it. It just tells you what needs to be achieved. So on the slide here are some notional examples of some needs. Um, so these um, are relating to a stakeholder that wants to make some money, um, you know, sorry, wants to have a business uh, selling high resolution imagery data. And uh, I think this is probably true for 99% of the customer market. Uh, you know, customers want to make money. People want to make money, right? Um, but the want to make money doesn't really, you know, you can't go and engineer a solution um, from the want to make money. Um, you know, that doesn't give you that building block um, to, to start your design. Though you might find later it does in fact constrain it. But, you know, that's something we have to bear in mind, but it's not gonna tell you exactly what to build. What we have to do and some of the starting points in this scenario then for exploring and determining kind of what needs to be done and what the outputs are and what the customer is interested in is the fact that we they want to have access to high resolution imagery data which is global and updated at least every 24 hours so those needs alone for example wouldn't drive you to a satellite solution it could be that they could go and buy imagery and, and then resell it from from another source but if you kind of take that example, you know, that comes with a number of limitations. You know, they're using a supply chain which they may, you know, may not be totally robust. You know, if, if someone stops taking those images, they then have nothing to sell. So they have a dependency they may not want. Um, they also might have limited influence over the type or quality of the imagery that's taken. And finally, you know, there could be, for example, like maybe copyright issues. You know, if someone may not appreciate this company buying their imagery and reselling it, rebadging it, and reselling it on. So, you know, let's assume in this case they've gone. You know, that's not a that's not a route forward for me. We want our own imagery. You know, we're going to have our own satellite system. That's the route that we're taking. So. In deciding on a satellite solution, this actually brings in needs from some of the other stakeholders that we we looked at previously. Um, so regulators are really interested in making sure that it's um, fit for purpose and will meet the licensing conditions. And operators, they want something that's easy to operate and control, right? Because they're the ones who have to deal with the satellite when it's in orbit on a day to day basis. So in order to better build an architecture, and therefore a physical product, we need to think about what functionality is required in order to service the needs that we've identified. And, you know, so this is kind of what the system has to do to make that need a reality. Um, so within the open source satellite itself, we are um, refining our functions and calling them um, features, uh, which are effectively functions that can be um, attributed to a single physical entity you know, to get us down to that nice granular level. Um, but across all of these levels, so needs, functions and features, um, requirements are, are generated to, to capture what, what they are. So. If we take a couple of the sample needs that I had uh, previously, and this so about wanting to take, uh, you know, to get, get high resolution imagery data, this helps drive, you know, helps us derive functions and features which we need to um, attri um, attribute to the system. So if we want to take pictures of the Earth, then, you know, it really helps 
to be able to, um, you know, point at the Earth because that's what we want to take pictures of. And if we're saying, you know, we want high resolution imagery, this implies you need to be able to do this with a, with a, you know, a, a good degree of accuracy, a fine degree of accuracy. So if we break this down further, we therefore need to be able to determine kind of what our attitude currently is. So attitude is where we are pointing and we need to work out, you know, if we're not pointing in the right direction, what steps do we need to take to make us point in the right direction? And then we need to do whatever it is we need to do to point us in the direction that we want to be. Um, we also, for example, will need a mechanism to get the imagery down to the ground. It's not much good if it's stuck up in space. Can't sell that very easily. So we need to better point at the ground station and also connect with it. Um, we also might decide, you know, to, to make sure we, we um, make sure our link is good, that we want to be able to um, check whether data has got down to the ground and resend any data that's got lost. Now, if you look at this, for example, um, we've got both their point at Earth and point at ground station. So they both maybe have some of the same features you know that actually you know to be able to to um be able to perform that activity they might actually use some of the same capability and so what we can do is we can go through and assess actually you know do those two um pieces of functionality actually you know lead to the same features because what we want to do is derive the minimum set of features you know we don't want to put loads and loads of complicated functionality in and you know and do the same three thing three or four different ways we want to keep you know the minimum feature set and so what we do is assess and see where the differences are and where we actually do need some new functionality so if you consider, you know, the fact that you need to better move your satellite, point your satellite, talk to the ground, you know, all of these functions really imply that you need to better generate some power. Um, and if we imagine, for example, that the concept of operations has it so that you could take imagery either at daytime or at nighttime. Well, this means, you know, you need a way to be able to store power, you know, so at night there isn't any sun and satellites typically generate their power through solar panels, um, and, you know, which you can you only, you only get when the sun is shining, you know, and um, at night there isn't there's no sun. So we need a way to be able to store the power that has been generated during those daylight hours um, so we can use it later. And we just continue this through. We look at all the different needs. We come up with the different functions. It might be some of these other functions then spark off some, you know, some other needs and things that we need to think of and so on and so forth. So it's really um, an iterative and recursive process and we'll go through it several times. And then what we should end up with is a set of kind of functions and features that we then go, OK, now how do we physically realise these? And that's when we go on to our architecture. Now, this is probably a good point for me to give you uh, my definition of, of what an architecture is and what some of the different kind of types or flavours there are. And in a nutshell, an architecture is, is, a, is a way to look at how elements are structured and what the relationships between the different aspects are. So it effectively gives you a representation of what your system will look like, a, a view of your system, you know, before it's, you know, physically sitting on your desk or your bench or whatever, is that, is that view in. And if I was to say to someone here, hey, draw me an architecture for X, Y, Z, um, you would probably all naturally draw a physical architecture. And this is something that we're probably all the most familiar with. So a physical architecture takes real world items and kind of looks at the relationship between them. And so it's conceptually the easiest kind of one because it's, you know, it has its foundations in real world things. So I'm going to start with a very simple example from the open source satellite. Um, uh, program and um, these are basically the two um, key building blocks of a satellite. Um, at the top there in the light blue we have the payload and at the bottom in the yellow we have the platform and the lines in between um, show the relationships, the physical relationships between those two entities. So we've got some transmission of power and also some data links too. And um, the platform in our case is actually the prime focus of the Oversource satellite. As I've already mentioned, we want to have that platform that you can use for a whole host of different applications. So what we can actually do now is, is go into the platform and see some more detail on the platform architecture. And this concept of hierarchies within architectures is not uncommon. And it basically allows the user, so whoever is generating or using this information that's being represented in an architecture, at a level of abstraction that's appropriate for them. You know, so um, at this level, if I if I gave this to kind of one of my engineers and said, hey, can you please make me this? There's not enough information there for them to do that. But, you know, for someone who, you know, 
maybe isn't interested in what goes inside the boxes, this is quite a nice way of visually representing the two key elements that go into a satellite. So um, we've got another, so this is, I say, we've gone inside that platform box and um, this physical architecture has, we have shown the physical blocks here kind of using their physical positioning within within the within the system um, and this helps provide like another layer of information and this is a really nice kind of feature of doing visual um, kind of aids is you can actually get quite a lot of information in um, in, in quite a, a clear and, and simple way whereas if you were to write out what this looked like it would be a very long um, sort of document and people you know if you then got them to draw from a written description you may not actually end up with the same diagram every time so just a quick walk around this um, the yellow box is our platform which is the yellow box you saw in the in the previous architecture and um, what we have in the center there sort of that orangey box is something that we're calling the integrated platform avionics or the ipa and this is a really important part of our of our um, architecture and a part of our design. So I know I've said this already, but one of the key um, parts of our open source satellite um, design is to have a platform that needs minimal rework between different um, applications. And so within that IPA, within that orange box, is everything that should never need to change between applications. So everything inside that orange box, we could almost have those orange boxes sitting on the shelf. And when we get a new, you know, got a new satellite through with a different application, you should be able to take that orange box and know that that box is done and you don't need to do any more work on it. That's the intention. And um, it houses a number of different subsystems. So, and these are really core um, important parts, some of which I've touched on already with when I've talked about the functions. So we've got a power system in there, you know, to do to do all the power related elements. We've got a transmitter and receiver. So that's the RX and the TX shown there. That allows us to talk to the ground and get information back from the ground. And as you can probably tell, judging by all the number of lines going into it, right in the center, right at the core, we have the most important element of all, which is our integrated platform API avionics processor. Now this is basically the brains of the entire thing, the entire platform, this is the brains of it. This is the thing that basically will tell you, will, will control where the satellite points, that you can talk to the ground, it will tell when to power things on and off, you know, it, it knows everything, and it is the master of how this whole platform will, will run. And the idea is, and, and it always pains me to say this because I'm a platform engineer, but you know, the, the platform portion of a satellite, if you think about it, is the bit you don't really want to have. It's like a necessary evil. You know, the payload is the cool whizzy bit that, you know, makes you your money because it takes pictures or it lets you get, you know, interesting data down or all those kinds of things. The platform is the bit you have to have to make the payload work, but it doesn't necessarily make you any money. So if you think about when you're trying to launch things into space, you know, you have a limited mass and volume envelope. So if your platform takes up a big portion of that of that volume, you know, then you're you're limiting what you can put into your payload, you know, and, and that's not that's not ideal. You know, the payload is the bit, let's say the bit that makes the money. So what we're also trying to do with the open source satellite um, design for the platform is to really kind of make the platform portion as small as possible. So what, how we're doing that is really looking at that, so that IPA, that integrated platform avionics, is getting that as integrated as possible to minimise that physical footprint. Um, so that's that's the idea there. And say, so what we should do is get down to something really quite small and takes up the minimum amount of space in the satellite. So you might say, well, okay, you've got some some green bits, and I understand. What about the blue bits that sit in that that platform? Well, we can't put everything into this small integrated uh, avionics in, in the centre. And um, the reason for that is, you know, um, although we're looking at targeting different applications, and we're also looking at targeting different classes of satellite. So we're looking from 25 kilo class satellites right through to 250 kilo class satellites. Um, and so when you have that big range, it, you know, there are different um, scenarios that come into play that you need to better accommodate. So if I take, for example, um, the reaction wheels. So reaction wheels are a way to kind of um, impart momentum into your satellite and change where it points. Now, if you have a small satellite, you only need a small reaction wheel to impart that momentum and get, to get it to move. So what you need at a 25 kilo platform 
compared to a 250 kilo platform is markedly different. The 250 kilo platform is going to need much larger wheels to be able to get that, that movement in. So what we've decided to do is actually kind of take the elements like that, which might scale and put them in the platform element. But the aspects that drive those, um, you know, those those components are inside the IPA because the way you control those is the same. It's just a physical mechanism that is changing size. Another reason for having some of those components sit in the platform volume rather than within the IPA is they actually physically need an external aperture. So the idea is the IPA will be in the center of the platform um, slice. Um, but you, you think about your solar panels, right? They work best if they can see the sun. So those need to go on the exterior of the craft. So those can never be within the actual integrated IPA because that's not going to see any, any daylight. So those are some of the reasons why we've got this, this split. And this is this is very much just a uh, a slightly simplified architecture for the view of getting it onto you know onto one slide that would work in this kind of forum. There's actually a load more information that's available, and you know you can put a lot more information into the different lines, onto the relationships, and also within the boxes themselves as well as you go down through the hierarchy. And I will show one more example of a little bit more detail on a coming slide. So that was physical architectures and hopefully something that some of you guys are, are familiar with. Um, I also want to talk very briefly about functional architectures and these are, are subtly different, but I think a really, really useful and interesting concept. And they're, they're a really interesting way to get from kind of your needs, functions and features, maybe across to your physical architecture. So when we're thinking about the functional architecture, what we're really looking at here is looking at um, the functions and the relationship between the functions, you know, so what functions have to be able to, you know, operate together to achieve a particular outcome. And you think about these agnostically of where they're physically located. Um, and, and personally, although I've presented them the other way around, I actually think it's useful to start with a functional architecture because this allows the architect to really kind of look what goes into the system and, and see where they've got all the functions, things that they need before, you know, they leap off and start designing all their their widgets. So. I've got a, a brief example here. Again, it's simplified just to make it, you know, fit and be palatable for going on a on a slide like this. So I've taken some of the functions that we talked about previously and, and put them into this architectural format. And um, you can see here I've got some groupings. So the kind of hexagonals are what I'm calling my functional groupings. And uh, within those um, functional groupings, there are the ovals, which are the individual functions. And so this kind of method helps you see whether you've actually got all of the functions you need to undertake a particular operation. And what you can do when you kind of think you've got your map of all your, your functions is you can do something looking at like what we call looking at flows, because you can look at which functions you traverse to get a particular operation completed and see whether you're, you're missing anything or whether any of your links are, are not there. So if I, I um, take an example, so looking, for example, at, you know, maybe the ground wants to command a change in attitude. So they want you to point somewhere else. So the operator said, oh, actually, no, I want you to point over here now rather than, than over there. So what I've just shown here is sort of the reddy, orangey sort of highlight of the lines is, you know, the path through the functions that you would take to make this happen. Um, and as I've said previously, we do this agnostically of where things are physically located. Um, so I've just highlighted a few items here. So in that physical architecture that I showed you previously, um, we had the IPA and we had the IPA process, the item that was the brains. So everything that's highlighted in blue here now, so the blue ovals, is actually a function that would be housed within the IPA processor. Um, and so this is a useful way to see, like, you know, functions can actually be, you know, um, distributed across different kind of um, operations and then you can look at actually how you how you then group them together and so this is actually something we did uh, for the open source satellite architecture we took a, a physical architecture took our functional architecture and then overlaid the functions across the across the physical architecture to make sure we actually had a good distribution and actually whether we needed to split any up further so it's a really really useful tool okay so that's that's um, architectures and, you know, I we're really lucky on the Oversaw Satellite Programme. You know, I got given a blank sheet of paper and said, design, design a satellite that does these 300 plus odd things. Off you go. 
but that's actually a really rare um, place to be. You know, a lot of the time you go into architecting or looking at designing a system with some kind of constraints. Quite often we're asked or instructed uh, to make use of things that already exist, you know, so maybe they're part of your company's product line or, you know, they already have some heritage or someone spent a lot of money making something and they darn well want to use it, you know, that kind of thing. So, but you should still do this architecture work. You should still do the kind of functional and physical architectures because it still allows you to confirm whether the system you're putting together as a whole is fit for purpose and you haven't missed anything. So there are lots and lots of things to consider when devising an architecture um, and making sure you've got something that's fit for purpose and it's going to satisfy the needs. Um, so what I'm going to do now is talk a little bit about like it's going to have an open source satellite or satellite bias, but the themes I'm going to talk about now are the same regardless of what you're designing, you know, whether it be a, a satellite, a car, a washing machine. It's just the degree of emphasis on some of these points might change depending on what you're designing. Um, so customers, as I've already said, are keen to make money and a really important factor as to whether, you know, your satellite or any system is, is able to do that is, is the concept of availability and reliability. So availability is a probability that your satellite or system will be operational at any point in time when it's wanted to be used. So if we said our satellite had a 99.99% availability, that means there's actually a 0.01% chance that the satellite won't be operational when it's needed. And I should note here, I think it's pretty much impossible to ever hit a 100% availability um, figure. You know, there is inv invariably at some point going to be some downtime. Um, you know, if, if I use satellites as an example here, you know, you might need to upload some new flight software because you found some bugs or similar, or you want to introduce a new functionality. So anytime you're not performing your normal operations, you know, that takes time away from you know, your availability figure. And um, also, unfortunately, you know, sometimes things do go wrong. And as I'm going to go through in the, the next part of this presentation, you know, the things we can do to help uh, mitigate and prevent that, you know, at some point, something is probably going to fail. Either your software is going to crash or some piece of hardware is going to fail. And again, this erodes your availability figure. Now, if we consider reliability, this is the probability that your, your system will actually meet the mission lifetime. So if there's a figure of 0.8, this means there's a 20% chance that your satellite will fail at some point in its mission lifetime. Now, today I'm not going to get into how reliability figures come about. There's a whole host of maths and you can look at like the reliability of relative components and you kind of follow them up and down chains and look at how they all accumulate. We're not going to go into that here, but it's really important to understand that there are these these concepts and these things to consider. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit now about robustness and, 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 and why we care, because it's really quite central to to our architectures and to the designs that we do. And unfortunately, there is one certainty in life, and that is failures will happen. And um, in the space industry, um, we don't have the ability, or at least not, not at the moment, to actually, you know, issue a recall and get, get our system back and, you know, fix it and then pop it back up into circulation. You know, kind of once it's up there, it's it's up there. So the only interactions we typically have um, in the space industry with a, something that's in orbit is um, maybe some comms um, from the ground and maybe the ability to change some software, but you generally can't change the hardware. What you've launched is what you've launched. And something else to think about is, Whenever you want to talk to your satellite, that actually costs money because you need to kind of hire out the use of some ground infrastructure. You have your operators who need to be able to do that. You know, you have this whole this whole kind of chain you have to pay for. So it's it's not a free exercise to talk to your satellite and make those changes either. And also, if we're thinking about low Earth orbit, you only get a few minutes to actually talk to your satellite as well. I think, you know, it's maybe seven, eight minutes, depending on kind of orbits and the light. So you get a short time to do whatever it is you want to do and you have to pay some money for it. And, uh, you know, space, as you all can appreciate, is it's not a not a cheap um, industry. You know, although the, the price point of space has been reducing, you know, it's still not cheap or any of us would call cheap. And it can take really quite a long time for, for companies to break even over the cost of, you know, actually launching a satellite because you have to pay off the cost of the satellite, you know, from your from the money you're making from your applications, you know, before you then just making money from your revenue from your from your application um, side. 
So if your satellite falls over before you meet the end of your mission life, you know, that limits the amount of money that you're going to be able to make. Um, you know, and things like, you know, you've got pretty harsh space environment and all these kind of things. So these are all factors that you need to consider when, when undertaking your design. And when we consider robustness, our overarching aim is for any kind of failure to not result in mission loss. Like mission loss is where we don't want to be. That's what we're trying to avoid at, at all costs. Well, at reasonable cost. So, so how do we how do we do that? How do we go about you know making something robust and trying to avoid the, the mission falling over? Um, the starting point. This is another one of my really important points. Um, so my second, probably super important point, is keep it simple. Start from somewhere simple. Um, then you want to consider having you know a system that can detect failures and be able to deal with them in some way. And ideally, you really want something that behaves in a known and consistent way when issues arise. You know, it doesn't do something different every time because it will make it a nightmare to work out what the, you know, the solution should be or, or how to kind of look at identifying the root causes, those things. You want something that behaves as far as possible in a deterministic and logical way. And, 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 oh no, I've got another really important point. My, my, I hope this is my last one. My third most important point is you have to consider this from the desire, the start of the design process. Um, you can't sort of, well, it's, it's hard and expensive to try and bake robustness in later. You really need to kind of make it an integral part of design and think about it from the start. And so um, there are a number of ways we can we can do this, um, and I, which I'm going to kind of um, go through now. And uh, redundancy is a really key one, and this is used quite extensively in the space domain. Um, it's a really... Um, neat way of, of building into robustness. And there are a few different kind of types of redundancy that I'm gonna, gonna go over. Um, so to start with, we have something called hot redundancy. So this is where you have two identical units and they are both on at the same time, right? So if one fails, the other one basically picks up the slack and, and continues the operations. So this is neat because it gives you, you know, shorter um, outage time because you know this one's already on so if this one falls over it, it can step in straight away um, so you're between that primary and redundant units which is what we tend to call um, the items but you do have the risk of common mode failures you know if they're both identical and they're both on all the time what's to say the other one isn't going to fail in the same way as your first one then we have the concept of cold redundancy so again we have two identical units but this time we only have one on at a time and then you turn the other one on when you need it. So this is neat because it's tolerant to um, systematic e effects such as radiation effects because you've only got one thing on. It also means that less power is consumed because you've only got one item on rather than two, but it does mean there's a more latency between kind of switching one unit on after the, you know, because you want to turn one off to turn one on. We also have the concept of functional redundancy. Now, this is an interesting one. This is where you might have a, another unit, but it's not the same as the unit that, that, that you're trying to kind of add some redundancy for. What you do is, you know, you might have a subset of the functionality of the first unit in this other unit um, or the most important parts of it. So it helps prolong your life. And finally, we have the concept of, um, you know, failing, you know, degrading gracefully. Um, this is where you go, well, actually, do you know what? I'm not going to be able to fix this problem, but the performance might just drop off. So in the case of satellite, um, this might be, for example, um, you have uh, a star tracker, uh, which uh, allows really kind of much finer um, accuracy with regards to your pointing. And it might be if that fails, you go, well, do you know what? Rather than trying to have multiple star trackers, which can be expensive pieces of kit, you know, I'm only going to have the one, and if that fails, I'll just rely on my other AOCS, AOCS sensors to do my pointing, you know, to help me point, and just accept that they won't be quite as fine the pointing as it would have been otherwise. So I've got a quick example here from from the open source satellite, and um, this is showing um, some 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 detail um, sort of inside that architecture that I showed you before, and this is our communications um, subsystem. And what you can see, so the green is what we call our primary chain and the blue is our redundant chain. And what you can see here is we have the two 
um, processes, those are cold redundant. And then we have two receivers and two transmitters. Now, receivers, these are effectively the ears of the spacecraft. They allow um, the ground to talk to satellite. Um, you know, and a, and a deaf satellite isn't a useful satellite. So we actually make our receivers hot redundant. So you have a fallback solution ready and waiting should, should one fail. Um, so that's that's the scheme there. Um, we have two transmitters, but those are not hot redundant. So those are the way that we talk to the ground. Um, those are actually cold redundant because in this scenario, if the ground thinks, hey, this is weird, the satellite's not talking to me, what it can do is it can, it can send a command and turn on the other transmitter and see if it can hear over that transmitter instead. So you don't need to have them both on all the time. The ground can control that interaction. Now, there isn't, I, I can't give you a magic sheet and say, this is how much redundancy you should have. You know, it's really dependent upon a number of factors, sort of mission needs, scheduling, budget. And there is the possibility, and I've had to pull myself back from this a few times, that you kind of head off again down one of these rabbit holes and you add all of the protection. You come up with all the possible issues and you think, well, I'll protect that and I'll protect this. And, and, and it's really tricky, but sometimes you have to remember that you only need to add enough um, you know, enough protection. You know, as I said before, the starting point is starting simple and only adding complexity if you need it. Because the more complexity, the more units you add in, the more possible failure points you add in, and the more you're going to have to analyze and assess. Now, we have a baseline in the satellite industry that uh, we want to be tolerable to credible single point failures. Um, so this could be considered at mission level. Um, so, you know, what happens if you lose one of the uh, satellite in a constellation? What does that mean for your overall performance at, at mission level or down at kind of subsystem level here? You know, what happens if I lose one of my receivers? And so we look at that whole, the whole let those different levels and those all those different combinations. And so you go great. So you, you're telling me I need to I need to be, you know, uh, put some redundancy or put some schemas in place to, you know, protect against failures. But you know, how am I actually going to know what what fails? And I'm very quickly going to whip through some of the different tools and approaches that can help you with this. And you start by considering feared events. And as the name suggests, these are things you really don't want to happen. So um, if we take the case of, um, you know, because we want to be responsible and sustainable users of space, we might put a dual bit of device, maybe a sail or maybe a propulsion system on our on our satellite. But we really don't want that to go off before we're ready to deorbit, orbit, right? Because once we deorbit, orbit, that's the end of your mission life. And that would not make you very popular. So you kind of go, OK, that's the thing that I'm that I'm worried about. How do I mitigate against it? And in this case, you know, we might take the concept of having an arm and a fire. So that someone can't just send one command to effectively end your mission life. You know, they have to send an arm. They go, do I really want to hit the fire button? And then send the fire, you know, when they're really, really sure. So what you do is you look at the events, work out what's of concern, maybe how likely these different events are. And you can consider them against your architecture that you've created. And then you see where you might need to add different mitigations or extra things in place to help mitigate against these feared events. Um, and there's two more tools I'm going to quickly talk about here. Um, we have fault tree analysis. So this is a, a tool that can be used to assess um, the root cause of high level functional failures. So the feared events that we just talked about. And so what do you basically do there is you map out all the contributing factors that lead to the feared event. Um, and you use Boolean logic, so like AND gates, OR gates, XOR gates and things to do that. And you can follow it all through and see what you know contributes to a particular um, failure. We also have something called a FMIKA, so that's failure modes, effects and criticality analysis. And this is a more bottom up approach. So you 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 look at a unit and what a failure within that unit and see actually how it impacts going up through your, your satellite, through your hierarchy and through your architecture. And so I've just put on the slide here some of the key differences. And um, it's really useful to make use of both of these techniques because they, they give slightly different perspectives. So, for example, it might be the fault tree analysis highlights a critical unit. And then you use the Famica to actually understand what changes you need to make within that unit to kind of help improve it and remove that, that risk. And then you take both of these approaches and you can use these to feed into something called fault detection, isolation and recovery or FDIR. So you've now kind of gone through and you've probably scared yourself with all the things that could go wrong with your satellite. You're like, oh no, I've got loads of problems. And you think, okay, well, the next thing to do is go, well, how, how do I know 
where my problems might be? How can I detect these problems? And it actually might be you don't have the functionality already built in to detect your failures. You might need to be able to add something in. And so we've done this on the OpenSource Satellite Program. Um, and if I take power as an example, power is a really limited resource um, in, in space. You know, if something starts drawing more power than it should, you know, it puts it could put the rest of the satellite at risk. Um, and so what we do is we monitor all the currents that are being drawn, all the power that's being drawn by our different units. And if something starts drawing more power than expected, we can then look at what we want to do, what steps we want to take. And so that then leads on to the next point of, you know, once you can detect the fault, you then work out how you want to isolate the fault. So in our power case, you know, you want it to stop propagating through to other units. So if something starts drawing more power than expected or more current than expected, you know, it could be indicative, for example, of a latch up event. So we would probably turn that item off and that would stop that problem from propagating. And then finally, as the name suggests, you know, we've got the R part, the recovery. We want to be able to recover from the failure. So you need to consider how you'd actually get back up and running after some of these different scenarios. So assuming it was a latch event in the case of our power example, this actually probably could be simply cleared by power cycling the unit and that might clear the problem and we just go back to operating as normal. But if something is like catastrophically failed within that unit, you know, some something's broken, it might be that power cycling just doesn't fix it. And actually that means that element just can't be used going forward anymore. So then what you need to do is think about, well, actually, how do I then reconfigure myself? Bearing in mind, you can't send someone up with a you know screwdriver or whatever to take some bits off and put new bits on. How do I change the way that my satellite's used? Maybe, for example, to use a redundant unit. How do I instigate that change? And if you didn't have a redundant unit at this point, you think, well, do I need to add a redundant unit in? What should I do here to kind of help solve and mitigate against this problem? Now, I promise I'm nearly at the end, and there's just two more concepts that I want to um, quickly go through. The first is talking about kind of safe modes, and these are used across the satellite industry. And this is basically a mode that we can go into, to uh, which is basically power safe. So it keeps the satellite power safe, so it makes enough power you know, to keep itself operational, and it's thermally safe, so it's not going to get too hot or too cold, and actually so the ground can communicate with it. And basically the idea is the satellite can stay in this mode indefinitely while someone on the ground has a little head scratch and works out what to do, do next. And what you really want here is the minimum number of units on to support this safe mode. So for our open source satellite, we literally, I think we have the power system and the receiver elements on, that's it. Everything else is powered, powered down to make sure we don't use too much power and we say power safe. That does mean, for example, we don't have our attitude control on, so our spacecraft will beginning to tumble. But in some cases, for some applications, this actually isn't this isn't viable. So what you would need to look to do is actually have a controlled um, safe mode. You know, you might have an imager um, for taking pictures of the Earth, and those have sensitive CCDs, CCD, sorry, at the back, which don't like looking at the sun very long. You know, you cause damage to them. So it might be you want to make sure that your imager doesn't point at the sun when you're kind of tumbling. So you might have to put a, a particular uh, mode in place to, to do that. Um, but that adds some complexity because then you need to have some of your ACS equipment on to control where you're pointing or control that, that spin. And then the final the final thing that we make use of, and I, I've already mentioned it a couple of times, is the use of uploadable software and having an architecture that can actually support that. Now, of course, in a perfect world, the software would be right first time and it would never need changing. Um, and but to get to a point where you've done enough work on some software that you go, yep, it's never going to need changing, it's totally a 100% perfect, is really quite large and not very practical. And so um, um, we have on the open source, we have the mechanism to upload new software to our satellite. Um, but this is actually like a non-routine operation. You know, it's not something the customer wants. The customer doesn't want us having to, you know, well, they would like us to be able to fix bugs, but they're not going to come, you know, at the beginning when they say, oh, I want to make money and I want to take pictures and say, oh, and can you upload some code. It's very unlikely to come from that avenue. It's a it's very much a need born out of the ability, uh, the desire to be robust uh, for our satellite to be robust. So if you think back to when we talk about architectures and stakeholders and things, if we only considered it from a stakeholder's perspective, we would miss some of these functions that we actually need that come out of when we look at some of the other detail and do some of the other work. So I think this really kind of helps highlight how we have to look at the whole thing holistically and do some of those different analyses. Right, that concludes a, a very much a whistle stop tour through how to uh, architect a satellite. Hopefully it's super easy and you guys can now all go out and, and uh, hopefully uh, go do one. But I mean, 
it's in all seriousness, I hope it's, you know, giving you a flavour of some of the important considerations for when kind of trying to tackle um, the design of satellite, you know, understanding problems, what people want, what your system needs to do. And so the key takeaways really are is, you know, you can't leave things to later. You have to bake it in from the beginning and you really need to start simple. So um, I think there's a few minutes left. So I'm going to just say thank you very much for your time and attention. There is some time now for questions if anyone has any. Um, otherwise, you are more than welcome to drop me a line um, offline and provide any feedback or ask any questions. I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to take those. If we don't have any questions, I will move on to the wrap up. Does anyone have any questions or do you want to put anything in the chat? Yes, we're good. Stunned everyone Thank into you. silence. <laughs> Thank you, Vicky. That was really informative. So that was great. So do you want to go on to the next slide? Yes, I will indeed. So all that remains is for you know, to say thank you very much um, for, for joining us today. And if you're if you're interested in finding out a bit more about the Open Source Satellite Programme, there are a number of ways you can do that. Um, you can sign up and get our email updates. We're also on social media. We'll put those links up at, at the end. Um, you know, we put lots of information up there, kind of share these videos and so on and so forth. And there's things you want to revisit that you've perhaps missed previously. Um, we also love to have, and previously we've had guest speakers. So if you have an area of interest that you're particularly, you know, passionate about and you'd like to share with a wider community then drop us a line we'd always love to have more more people come in and talk um and i think that's that's it i mean 2023 has flown by and you know we're really looking forward to 2024 it's a really exciting year in the open source satellite program and you know we're looking forward to kicking off our next series of of sessions and uh, we're actually be starting one that Catherine will be giving us um, next year and it's a really it's a really interesting and pertinent topic um, we'll be looking at um, the solar cycle what is it and why do we care and so that's going to be on the 25th of January in 2024 I can't believe I'm talking about 2024 already but this should be a fascinating session because um, it's only may be aware we are rapidly approaching solar maximum so there's going to be lots of interesting things um, in the in the news i'm sure about it next year and so Catherine will be able to explain to us all what what it is and 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 and, and why we care i think i just saw a question pop up yes a, very a question quickly. did appear yes. in the chat excellent which so very, was uh, uh, what software do you use for drawing architectures that is a good question um so um the ones i showed you today i've just drawn in a drawing package um, what we do sometimes start with is good. Oh, I was going to point because behind me that you can't see because I'm currently in a mountainous snowy landscape is a whole bank of whiteboards. So we we'll sometimes start with whiteboards and pens and take photos of them. And then sometimes we'll put them into like a drawing package. Um, we also use model based system engineering techniques here as well in our open satellite program design. So we also make use of um, some formal tools there as well. So um, things like enterprise architect and the like. So it just really depends on kind of what you're trying to do um, with them. But I mean, some of them, you, you could draw them in PowerPoint if that was something that was accessible to you. Um, the advantage of the model basis engineering tools or the MBSC tools is it allows you to make linkages with other information. And so you can you can like look at uh, maybe link your architecture and your functions to some of the requirements and so on and so forth. So you get some of that metadata behind that you don't get when you just draw a flat a flat picture. Hopefully that helps to answer the question. We've also and been asked if we record and we do record and this will appear in our YouTube in the coming days, I think. So, on our YouTube channel. Lovely. Thank you, Catherine. Awesome. OK, well, oh, all that remains more oh. questions. Oh, sorry. What for Mika is required? Functional and interface for Mika's? That's really interesting. And I, and I think it's it's a little bit of a little bit of both. I mean, um, it's, I must admit, I'm guilty of this whenever I start doing them. Sometimes I forget about the interfaces because I'm so focused on what the boxes actually do and, and the widgets actually do. But it's actually having to look at a bit of both. Because one really interesting thing, if you think about the interfaces, if you only have one way into a into a unit and um, and that has the, the functions in it, even if you duplicate those functions within that unit, if you can only get into it through one way, that potentially is a weak spot. And so sometimes that leads us to think about, you know, do we need primary redundant interfaces? And then how do we handle those? Because one of the real tricky things is the more things you add in, You've and also got to think about what is the master, what is in charge of everything that's going on, and how do you know when to change between your different interfaces or between your different units? So it does make it more complicated. But yes, I would I would look at personally, I would look at look at both if that helps. Right, some really excellent questions. Yeah. So okay. Super. 
Cool. All right. So then literally all that's left for me to say is thank you so much for your support um, for me and the team here, you know, um, uh, both KISP and within the OpenStar Satellite Programme, you know, we Thank you all very much for for, for tuning in um, with us over the last year and, and we really look forward to seeing you next year and we just want to wish you all a lovely uh, restful and recharging winter break and uh, we'll see we'll see you next year so thank you very much thank you everybody <laughs>